Hi everyone, this is my first Payments New Zealand conference and it's been great to see so many speakers talking about payments innovation globally and here in New Zealand. I'm really excited to be here representing Paymark as the sponsor of the Payments New Zealand FinTech Innovation Challenge. Paymark is proud to be the lead partner with the banks and Payments New Zealand in driving the open banking API standards in New Zealand. About 30 years ago, Paymark established itself as New Zealand's first fintech. Back then, New Zealand needed a solution that would help businesses connect with consumers, deliver instant access to customer accounts, and do all of that securely, seamlessly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year round. Paymark managed to do just that. And today, we take for granted how easy it is to shop, to spend money or buy products and services, to use one type of card in any terminal in thousands of outlets around the country and increasingly online. In fact, over 18 billion transactions have been processed by Paymark. Imagine what New Zealand would look like if we hadn't got together on the current payment model. Today, New Zealand enjoys being an almost cashless society and we still lead the way with regard to card payments. Just look to the US and most of Europe who are still playing catch up. I remember as a kid, my father owned a supermarket and he used to have a safe full of cash at the shop and at the end of the day, we would walk it down the street in a bank bag to the bank. I remember the day the FPOS terminals were installed. Wow, how things have changed. Thanks to early collaboration, Unlike in other parts of the world, New Zealand doesn't have multiple terminals on the countertop, like Asia, or ATMs lined up like a showroom in the bar, like the US, and we don't suffer minimum spend requirements in cafes and bars as they do across the ditch, and we don't have piles of cash as the means of our primary payment, as they do in Japan. All of this is down to New Zealand's retailers and banking institutions working together on a common goal, to create a fast, secure and ubiquitous payment ecosystem. Today we've got another huge wave of innovation coming to the payments industry. Everyone's talking about open APIs and new mobile payment experiences. But what's it all about? As I mentioned, Paymark has played a role for the last 30 years to enable safe, secure payments for New Zealand merchants, banks and consumers. Paymark's been working, working hard to make sure that we can enable the same ubiquitous customer experience in the new digital world. We've built an open payments platform using the Open Banking API, which is enabling a range of new digital payment innovations, the first of which is online FPOS. Working with a number of banks and merchants, we've delivered a real-time mobile debit payment experience which over 1.2 million Kiwis can access. Our goal is to create an open payments API ecosystem that allows participants to innovate faster than we've ever done before. Just like 30 years ago, it was important for us to come together. We want to do the same again. Plug in once, get access to all. In turn, enabling New Zealand-led innovation for banks, merchants, and most important, New Zealanders. So here we are, a fork in the road, defining the brave new world of payments. It should be easy, near and visible, a tap and you're done. However, if our industry does not get it right, it becomes a barrier to commerce that leaves customers and retailers unhappy and unfulfilled. I know myself how frustrating it is. I'm sitting on my couch, watching TV, glass of wine in my hand, the dog's on my feet, and my trusty mobile's a glance away. The phone beeps, my favourite dress is on a flash sale, but where's my wallet? Damn, it's over there in the kitchen. It seems a mile away. I don't know about you, but I find it hard to remember a 16-digit number, an expiry date and a CVM. Well, another sale lost, another transaction gone, and that dress, well, maybe another day. But wait, I've got online FPOS. 
All I need is my phone, my banking app, and I'm done. But it's not just about online. It's about Kiwis and how they want to access their money. And with these new open APIs, we need to provide a ubiquitous, seamless payment experience, no matter how or where you want to shop. We know New Zealand's a small market. As a result, success has come from collaboration, where the industry works together. We have to build a digital experience that takes the best of new wave of technologies and applications and combines it with that original premise of providing a shared platform we can all use. Paymark has this platform and we're excited to bring new, secure, reliable payments innovation to the market and to work with fintechs, banks, merchants and the rest of the industry on future fam focused payments landscape. So that's Paymark's challenge to the innovators here today. Build products and services that enable Kiwis to shop, not stop. Produce an experience that expands retail opportunities and creates new revenue streams. And do it in a way that takes advantage of a platform that already exists and is making difference to retailers and Kiwis today. Whether we're out with friends and we want to share the cost of a dinner, or whether we see a pair of shoes on Instagram and want to buy them immediately. Our job as an industry is to make that happen. We need to keep opening up these opportunities. So back to that word open. We have heard a lot today about open banking, open payments, open APIs, but what do we mean by open? Well, at Paymark, open is an invitation. An invitation to share, collaborate, and develop innovation together. So there you are, an invitation to join us on this journey. Talking of journeys, let's get back to why I'm here. The Payments New Zealand FinTech Innovation Challenge. We've got some fantastic finalists and we have to support them on their journey of innovation. They represent a cross-section of categories, each looking to creatively solve some of today's business and social challenges. I'm delighted to stand here and wish them all the best for the future. Two years ago, Paymark were handing out this award to Genoa Pay, an up-and-coming startup, now a valued partner of Paymark, creating innovative choice for New Zealanders. That's why we're here, supporting this event and challenge. It's about enabling innovation in New Zealand. We can't do this individually, we have to do it together. So let's be open, and support these finalists on their journey. Thank you. Shall we get into it? The first finalist to pitch is Gavin Mail of Money Compare. Gavin. There we go. Oh, we're gone. OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gavin Mail. I'm the founder and managing director of moneycompare.co.nz. So Money Compare is a comparison site. And we all compare every day of the week. Uh, every hour of the day. We compare what we have for lunch, we compare how we live, we compare our sports teams, whether they cheat or not, we compare money, um, and we compare all aspects of money. We compare how much we get paid with our colleagues, we, get, we compare how much tomatoes cost in the summer versus, uh, versus at the moment. Um, and we compare financial products and financial um, interest rates and all aspects of the important decision points within a financial product. But that's tricky for the everyday consumer. So obviously everyone in this room is a bit more uh, au fait with finance than the majority of uh, the Kiwi population. And there are thousands of different financial products uh, from hundreds of different financial service providers. Uh, and so we're there to sort of help them out. And that is exactly where Money Compare comes in. So we're going to list and compare thousands of different financial products from all of those different hundreds of financial service providers. And we're going to give the information and the data points for those consumers that they will need to help them find the best financial products for their particular needs. And Money Compare is the, the next cab off the rank from the team at NZ Compare. So we've already built and launched Broadband Compare and Power Compare. And uh, Money Compare is going to be what we believe the biggest aspect of that um, family of sites. So how does it work? Well, Money Compare is, is pretty simple. 
Uh, a user will visit the site. Um, and I think there's a video. No, oh, there we go. Um, and in this particular example on the screen, which we've sped up slightly, because I only have three minutes and 55 seconds left, um, a user will visit the site. They'll see all the different uh, loans available uh, in the marketplace. We'll also cover all those different categories. They're then able to use the filters to sort and um, break down by the things that are important to them. So be that uh, the amount of the value of the loan, APRs, what they're looking for the loan for, um, and there'll be different filters for each different um, financial product. And then they'll be able to add those into their own different comparison list where they'll be able to look at the products in a easy to compare side by side um, display. Where some of the um, features are, are identical, they're able to sort and filter by those and then hide those parameters that are not gonna be of any use with a comparison because they're identical to the other bits allowing them to make a sort of informed decision based on the key bits of information that they need to make that um, choice with a bit more information. Um, once that's done, they'll basically fill out a short form uh, and be redirected through to the end advertiser site, uh, where they then go ahead and complete their application, safe in the knowledge that they've been presented with all the various options available to them in the market. So that's how it's gonna work for the consumer. But how does it work for the finance company? So each product and each provider on Money Compare will have a unique piece of tracking code in place. And when the consumer comes to the site and they complete their comparison, when they click through and are redirected to the advertiser site, in this case, uh, Kiwi Bank, um, they'll then go through the application as normal on the, on the um, finance provider website. Once they've completed that application um, and the thank you page is displayed, we'll have our tracking integrated onto the advertiser site, and that tracking will marry with the referral link, pull those two bits of information together, and record that application um, as having originated from Money Compare. At this point, the advertiser will pay us our commission, and Kiwi Bank will acquire their customer, and that will be on a pure pay-for-performance basis. So that's obviously um, how it works. Uh, and that's basically the way the model is working in comparison sites overseas. And comparison sites are a huge trend in online shopping overseas. We're seeing 85% of UK consumers using a comparison site in the last 12 months if they have internet access. And we're already seeing demand in New Zealand. These are our user numbers across broadband compare and power compare, and we've seen those growing since we launched in 2016. The size of the market is impressive just within New Zealand. Some quick examples, and that's before we even take into account, I mean, those two as, as ballpark figures, and that's without the other verticals of credit cards, loans, uh, insurance, and so on. And also, we're able to take this model overseas with the platform, which we can launch into different verticals in different countries. So what are the benefits for the consumers and the finance providers? Well, first of all, for the consumer, transparency and absolute ease of use they'll be able to see all of the products aggregated in one place rather than hitting off individual finance providers. For the advertiser or the finance provider, uh, it's a pay for performance model. No more money paying for clicks through from Google. You're only paying when things convert into an application or a lead. We're gonna level the playing field out. There's gonna be equal share of voice for those smaller providers who have got fantastic products. Um, that might not have a marketing budget to compete with some of the big guns. And that's going to all lead to greater competition and enhanced efficiency within the sector, driving greater results for the Kiwi population. And that's six minutes. <laughs> all right, four minutes on the clock, please. Over to you, judges. Well done, Hello. Gavin. Is the mic on? Yep. Well done, very good. Um, Thank you. A couple of quick questions. Um, what's your competitive advantage in the differentiation you know, that you have? And a bit of a 90 degree to that. Um, do you have to, and if so, how do you protect or provide for um, user privacy, uh, given you've got both sides of the equation on the business side and on the consumer side? Cool, perfect. Uh, so on the uh, consumer using the site, I'll answer privacy first of all. Uh, so we won't actually take any of the application details ourselves. We won't be handling that process. 
That will all be on the actual finance provider's website, so all of that information will be handled in their usual website environment. We'll be taking terms and conditions and privacy opt-in for the short form that we request, so the name, address, and telephone number, and so on. Uh, and with regards to competitive advantage, we think really it's, it's the usability of, of our sites, and in conjunction with those other verticals that we've got uh, under broadband and power, we're hoping that NZ Compare, or not hoping, it will, uh, NZ Compare will basically be the number one sort of trusted source of consumer information um, aggregated into one site. Um, uh, very useful service you're working towards and Thank you. providing transparency. My uh, question would be around what challenges do you foresee in taking this model to a vertical market abroad? Uh, so, thank you. So, so the challenge into going overseas, obviously the, the bigger sectors, so some of those overseas countries, sorry, so UK and US already very established competitors in there. Um, over the ditch is probably our easiest expansion, um, and Australia has a number of, of comparison sites at the moment, but they're, they're sort of like the first tranche of comparison sites. They're not really the most easy to use and, and user-friendly. Um, and so we're sort of approaching it much more from the consumer site than from almost the lead funnel scenario that um, some of those sites there have at the moment. And it's all about, for us, gathering all the information for all of the providers, whether they're partners with us or not, uh, and we'll list everybody on the site. All of that information will be there um, so we have a complete full view. Let me just a parenthesis, so would you uh, complete a number of uh, offerings here in New Zealand before you attend? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so Broadband Compare is already successful and, and launched and running and doing very well. Power Compare launched two months ago. Money Compare launches next month. Uh, we'll start with yeah. probably Broadband and then into Power and, and so on. Hi there. Cool. You've got um, one minute. Um, one minute. <laughs> How easy is it for the financial institutions to actually integrate with you? So, and, and how many do you need before it actually becomes you know, um, quality comparison? Yep. Uh, so as I mentioned before, we, we will list and compare everybody, whether they are a partner with us or not. Uh, what we won't do is send that traffic to them. So if they're a non-partner, we'll basically say this, this provider is not a partner. You can find the plan on their site or, or on their, um, in their branch. Um, with regards to integration, it's, it's the same type of technology that has been integrated by finance companies across the globe. And here in New Zealand, we've integrated successfully with major companies on the broadband side. We work with Vodafone, with Spark, with the Vocus Group. Uh, all of those guys have, have integrated our tech without any issues. Um, and we're sure that we can do it on the finance front as well. With a cool 10 seconds to spare, please put your hands together for Gavin Mail of Money Compare. Thanks very much. I'll leave that there. Thanks, guys. Yeah, please be generous with your support. It's an intimidating thing to do to do this, let alone be first up. So well done, Gavin. Our second finalist to pitch is Simon Brown of Banker. Please put your hands together for Simon. Right, six minutes on the clock, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Simon, and I'm part of the team at Banker. So as I'm sure you'd all agree, there are a heap of awesome fintech solutions in New Zealand. Fintech solutions have the potential to improve the lives of many. But I've got a question for you. How prepared do you think the next generation, maybe your kids, your grandkids, are going to be, to, how prepared are they going to be to engage in those fintech products? And maybe more importantly, how good is their understanding of basic financial con concepts going to be that will allow them to flourish in a financial sense? My answer to that is not prepared. And that's the same revelation one of our co-founders, Kendall, came to a bit over three years ago. At the time, the conversation she was having with her then 12-year-old brother transformed from being about cricket and pro wrestling to being about interest in tax. It turned out that her teacher, his teacher, Micah, was running a classroom economy, a system that he had been refining over 10 years with hundreds of students. The system was awesome, but it wasn't really set up for the digital age. It was taking a long time to maintain, and Kendall thought thousands of students should have the access to this sort of education. And so Banker was born. 
Three years on, what does Banker look like? Banker transforms the classroom into a virtual economy. Students have their own mock online bank accounts, they're paid a fictitious wage for coming to school, and just like you or I, they hopefully pay their bills. Throughout the year, they interact with a heap of different financial concepts. These include the likes of interest, where they obviously learn about percentages, and they have the opportunity to open term deposits and see their money grow faster. They prepare basic CVs and apply for classroom jobs which their teacher creates. We've seen police officers, baristas, it's really up to the teacher and some get pretty crazy. They can save for their classroom retirement and through KiwiSaver, deciding how much they put aside and whether it's low, medium or high risk. It's always interesting at the end of the year. And later in the year they can take out mortgages and purchase investment properties. Hopefully, off the back of this, they insure it. Because if their teacher's having a rough week, on Friday morning they can create a natural disaster. If students are prepared, they'll be safe. But if not so, they learn the hard way. And as you can see, a heap of different um, disasters there for the teacher to pick from. So why do we do this? Research has shown that there's currently a reliance on parents to introduce these sorts of financial concepts. But this doesn't always work. Parents don't have the financial capability themselves, or they just don't have the time. We also know that while some students may have an understanding of these basic financial concepts, putting it into practice can be a totally different thing. And this can be costly in the real world. So that's why we've developed a standardised financial education platform. One where students can make mistakes in the safe confines of the classroom. And that brings us to our mission, to ensure that all kids are prepared for the financial world ahead. As a social enterprise, we hold this mission dear to our hearts, and for us, it sits right, right alongside profit. And to ensure we're fulfilling this mission, we measure improvements in financial capability and literacy of students throughout the year. When we initially started, we are a traditional SaaS product, with schools paying $8 per student per year. However, we quickly saw what we considered to be a pretty, pretty perverse skew towards higher decile schools. At that stage, we partnered with KiwiBank in New Zealand and later NetWealth in Australia, who support those schools to use banker free of charge. We also work with a, a bunch of other organisations, including Equifax and the Insurance Council of New Zealand, who support specific modules within the platform. The consumer-facing operations of these partners has also allowed us to grow our reach in New Zealand. On that reach, since launching a bit over three years ago, we've grown to be used by over 850 schools throughout New Zealand. That's around 40% of New Zealand primary and intermediate schools, and represents around 61,000 students. A little more recently, we launched in Australia. There, we've been growing to be used by over 7,500 students. Due to the online nature of our platform, Schools can access this in the most remote parts of the country. And we have schools in the south that are WACA and in the north using the platform. So what does the future look like for Banker? For us, it's about continuing to deepen and broaden our social impact. Deepening our social impact in the sense that we want this education to be accessible to all. And we're currently working with Select Kuta and Iwi around a Tulare Māori translation and contextualisation. And we hope to launch that in the coming months. A little further, further afield, we're looking to broaden our impact and enter our next overseas market. We appreciate that this is a global issue. We're exploring both, the North, both Canada and the US as they both have mandatory fi financial education to a certain extent. And we're working with the president of the Michigan Council of Economic Education around a pilot later in the year. When I talk to people about what we do at Banker, a common response is, wow, I wish I'd had that when we were at school. I often then get the frank admission of, I could probably do with that now if I'm being honest. I'm hoping there's not too many people like that in the crowd. But if there's anyone having that comment, I've got a that thought, I've got a couple of people who want to share a little advice with you. A couple of people who I believe, thanks to the financial education they have in their classroom each day, are going to be well prepared to engage in fintech products. And people who are going to be well in control of their financial futures. Anyway, enough from me. Over to them. Term deposit is when you lock your money away. Oh. Term deposit is when you lock your money away for a long period of time and you earn more interest. Insurance is a way to protect your house and help you pay it off when a disaster hits. Uh, Kiwi Saver is an investment fund where you can. Save money for a time.
you. Well done, Simon. You squeaked the video in there. I'm like four <laughs> minutes on the clock now. Let the Q&A begin. Um, I'll kick off. Um, thank you. Great presentation and a great idea. Um, obviously, education is changing. Do you, how easy is it to add in other modules to other course, courses? Yeah, great question. I mean, we face challenges in the fact that um, financial education is a, poor, a core part of the curriculum. And it's not something that teachers commonly think of when they think about what they should be teaching their kids. Um, but for us, we're seeing um, an increased uptake from teachers. It's something that they're conscious that they believe their students need to have, and particularly from parents. And the way we've designed the platform is that it really integrates into existing curriculum. Um, so rather than teaching kids about interest, when they're teaching kids about percentages of maths, then they relate it to interest. Same with KiwiSaver, risk and future thinking. So for us, it's about making sure what we're teaching them, these financial concepts, align neatly to the curriculum and that we communicate clearly to teachers that it can e easily be integrated. Great social purpose. Um, Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Um, how, what do you need to see the business doing to achieve sustainability through the current partnerships? Yeah, I guess for us, we're, um, I guess we're fortunate that we've, we've achieved a certain degree of sustainability to date and the fact that we've been bootstrapped, so we've been able to progress through three years um, self-sufficiently. Um, for us, it's about continuing to grow abroad um, and entering the likes of the North American markets and bring on um, new corporate partners there. For us to, um, to really be successful in a market, we need to have a, a corporate partner um, because we want to see financial education accessible to all schools and all students. Um, finance, finances shouldn't be a, a barrier to financial education, so that's probably key for us. Thanks, Simon. It's um, great to see you get this far after I saw you when you first launched oh, awesome. a couple of years ago. Awesome. Um, for the audience here, just explain us uh, a little bit more about your model, your customer acquisition model on the one hand, and what you're doing to manage churn on the other. Yeah, so I guess our, our customer acquisition, I mean, um, we sell, or we approach teachers directly um, and sign them up to the platform, and for them it's as easy as signing up and getting going, thanks to um, the sponsorship they receive from Kiwi Bank in New Zealand and NetWealth in Australia. Um, and we have a heap of resources that make it easy for them to introduce those, these financial concepts into the class. Um, in terms of churn, I guess that's how we manage that as well. Um, unfortunately, not every, not every teacher has, a, has great financial capabilities themselves. So for them, it can be quite daunting. I mean, the idea is great. They can sign up and get started. And then if, if they don't feel comfortable talking about KiwiSaver, and managing their own KiwiSaver, they're not going to talk to a bunch of 30, 12-year-olds. So for us, it's making sure that we, we provide them with that comfort. So we have a heap of resources that ensure they're, they're up with the play and they feel confident in, in introducing those concepts. So you've got a good platform for growth for the future. So um, over the next couple of years, what do you see as your, you know, a couple of your key challenges and what strategies are you considering to be able to deal with those? Yeah, so I think um, the fact that we've been bootstrapped to date has been great because it's, it's allowed us to learn what does and doesn't work on our own terms. Um, so we've, had, we've learned a lot of lessons going into Australia particularly, um, and going forward we're going to be able to apply those lessons as we grow. Um, I think there is a potential for us to look to raise some capital in the future to allow us to, to accelerate that growth now that we have those learnings. So I think the, the challenges for us are continuing to accelerate into new markets um, and bring on those, those corporate partners as well in those markets. Any final questions, judges? You've got them stumped with 20 seconds to spare. Please put your hands together for Simon Brown of Bank. Thank you. All right, our third finalist to pitch is John Pomalis of Boss Pack. Welcome, John. Good luck. Put your hands together. Six minutes on the clock, please. In 15th century, sailors were using stars to navigate the oceans. Soul traders today are using very similar technique, stargazing, to estimate their taxes and obligations. In other words, they are using the wrong tools to navigate their finances. I am John, co-founder of the Boss Pack. And BossPack is a platform that allows self-employed people, contractors, freelancers to manage their income, expenses, and tax in a super easy way. 
just to remind that salt, salt traders, contractors, and freelancers are working in absolutely every industry in New Zealand. They work for small companies, large companies, banks, and the government as well. <laughs> Did you know that salt traders have to comply and have to tick all the same compliance boxes as a small business. That means they can have up to 15 different payments throughout the year, starting from ACC levies, student loans, provisional tax, income tax. And this system works if you have a finance team, but we are talking about sole traders. And there are 700,000 of them out here in New Zealand and 35% of them receive unexpected tax bills in the first two years. And because of that, they just don't know what's coming up. And 66% are out of the business in the first five years. Before BOSPAC, you could just read everything online. It is all there in the 102,000 website pages. Good luck to figure out what you really need to do, to do next especially if you don't know what you are looking for. So BOSPEC is here to help. BOSPEC is for the smallest ones that loves to do things themselves. It doesn't really require any accounting prior knowledge, and you can be first-time contractor or already well-seasoned. If you want something more, then there are other solutions, accountants, other platforms, but we are for the small ones. Probably you're asking, how does it work? So first of all, you're answering some simple questions, and you just have to select from the options. It is hard to press something wrong. After that, you need to raise your invoices and claim your expenses. For example, if you buy a laptop, you just enter $1,000, you select from the list laptop, you upload your receipt, that's it, you're done. What we will do, we will take your receipt, store it, we will depreciate your laptop, and add it to the financial statement. And with BOSPEC platform, you will always know what's coming up for you, because we will estimate your tax. You will always have real-time real calculation view for your, all your taxes, how much and when you will need to pay. Even better, for planning the future, we will show you unreached thresholds. That means how much you can earn before you will need to start paying, for example, provisional tax. And to make everything even simpler, here is your GST return. Now it's a pleasure to be self-employed, and our customers are paying from $15 to $25 per month to, to get access to this pleasure. And they can choose it to do it either monthly or annually. And our clients have tried as well other solutions which are out there, but they have selected BOSPEC because it is so easy to use for them. And we launched our product just a month ago, and by the end of this month, we are looking to have 50 users on board. Just in comparison, I want you to remind that accounting software Zero filed for their IPO when they had 100 customers on board. Not only sole traders, but the most innovative accounting practices loves what we are doing. As a result, we are proud to announce that we are bringing on board the first of, first of accounting practice that will use BOSPEC for their sole traders. For them, it will mean that they will be able to streamline their processes and just do less work. What else you can wish for? So this is a perfect solution as well for them because Sole traders will do more, more of the self-service than they will need to do with other systems. We are a startup, and we are always seeking for the opportunities. So if you can help us to spread the word, please, please put us in your newsletters or just say, us, say about us to your neighbor. Or there is another option, you can become our partner, especially if you are working with contractors. So if there are just two things from today I would love you to take away, then one of them is that BOSPEC is a solution, a platform for contractors, so that they don't screw up their obligations. 
Another thing, once customers start using BossBack, they will have the time for the, star for the stargazing, and this time for the right reasons. Thank you. Well done, John. Four minutes on the clock, please. And I will throw you to the mercy of the judges. Hey, John. Uh, congratulations on the presentation. Um, give me a sense, how do you acquire customers so far of the ones you've acquired? And how do you position BossPack against the other accounting providers out there who also look after compliance? So currently, most of the other platforms which are out there, they are built purely for accountants, and people are trying to upskill themselves, actually to try to figure out what I need to do, what is debit, what is credit, and that is what we found quite confusing, especially we found it during our initial uh, conversations with our potential clients, so we did a lot of customer research before we actually wrote the first line of code. And just to answer your question about customer acquisition, we are working on various ways how we can reach out. Initially, the plan was to go out and just market directly to the customers. But now, in these last literally few weeks, we have had more phone calls from the accounting practices and the bookkeepers who are actually very interested in the work we are doing and how they can integrate with us so we can actually help them to, to achieve and actually, at the end of the day, earn more by doing less. Uh, very good, John. Very good. Um, uh, two questions. One is, um, at the moment, is your model more partner, partner related as opposed to direct selling? So you want to go through counting practices and bookkeepers? And secondly, um, from the feedback you're getting from your early adopter customers, are you hearing anything about needing to be uh, partnered and integrated with accounting online uh, programs like Xero and MYOB? So uh, I'll start with the second one. Once uh, we started this journey, we wanted to see how we can integrate with the platforms which are already out there. And we found that it is quite tricky to do it because all of them almost provide some kind of APIs, marketplaces. But if the platform, for, ex for example, provides 10 different capabilities, we can do just three things through the API. As a result, we decided to step back and look, hey, do we really want to do it now or wait for a while when it makes sense and other platforms out there have more matured? And what was the first, first one was? <laughs> yeah, that was the um, integration with um, uh, the, the um, packages. I was also cons wondering what your go-to-market strategy was, whether it was more oh, yep. direct or sure. more through channels. So uh, initial plan was to go to the direct, but we feel that actually going through the partners gets much better market traction, at least currently. And our plan from now on is to use more this strategy and to test if it works. And if, it, if this responds better, then we will definitely go through the partners. And so we, have, we are now putting in place the partner programs so they can come on board and uh, work with us as a partners, not only just the sole trader as such. Um, just a question about the data entry. So a lot of the accountancy practices and firms have displaced 80% of their data entry costs by doing data feeds and uh, you know, narration matching. Um, are, we, are, you, are the customers actually manually entering their data or are, they getting, are you enabling data feeds from the banks? So what we found, what, it, what might be quite surprisingly, if we talk with accountants, then one of the first questions is, hey, where are my data feeds? Once we talk with these super small businesses, then the data feeds are not the top priority for them, especially once uh, there is mom who is sitting at home earning 10K a year. She doesn't need the data feeds. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's, that's, the answer of, that's my question. <laughs> well done. Thank you. <laughs> Well done, John Pramalis of Boss Pack. Our fi last finalist to pitch is Brendan Roberts of Ada. Please give him a warm welcome. All right, I'll let you catch your breath. We'll put six minutes on the clock. 
Thank you, Max. Go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brendan. Um, Pete's sitting over here. Um, we're creating ADO, which is a digital assistant for small businesses. We passionately believe in small businesses being the underpin of the, a lot of the economies around the world. They employ a lot of people. They, they're very, very valuable to the economy. And we want to use AI to make small businesses a lot more successful. So before I talk about ADA and what it is that we're doing and how we're building it, I'll just give a bit of a, a changing scenery for you. So um, the evolution of UI, how we interact with our software is changing quickly. It used to be about characters, then it became about web and scale, made it made, needed to look a little bit prettier, then it became about mobile and touch, and now it's about voice. Um, we've seen a lot of those trends through the conversations today. It's about natural language and a really, really natural way of consuming your software. A couple of key facts around voice, there's already one billion voice searches per month going on, and 50% of search will be done by voice by 2020, which is not too far away. So voice is growing really, really quickly. It's enabled by mobile, it's enabled by AI, um, it's enabled by the proliferation of data and IoT, and it's also a lot of the demand of customers, especially younger people coming through into the workplace. They're used to sending messages, used to using their mobiles, and used to consuming software in a slightly different way. So that being said, what we're targeting is small businesses. There are lots of them out there, um, and they used to adopt cloud applications. Um, 2011, there was 27% of them were using cloud apps, and now it's up to 94%. That's important because all of those cloud apps have a lot of data, and that data is available through APIs, and we're partnering with a lot of those cloud apps to get data. What AI needs is data. So that's some of the background. It's not only just about the business apps, though. It's about their macro and environmental data that these small businesses operate in. If we're going to be the digital assistant, we need to know what's happening in the big wide world, what's happening with weather and traffic and social trends. And then on the finance side of things, small businesses, and, and you know, we know how critical finances are. So um, open banking, PSD2, and fintech partners, how do we use finance to make sure that, as a digital assistant, small businesses are making the best decisions and taking the best actions? So the problems we're solving for these small businesses is that they actually have a lot of data. The data's stuck inside the cloud apps. It's not in one place. They don't know how to interpret it if they could get to that data. Um, and it's siloed. These guys are really, really time poor. They're not going to sit there and try and analyze that data. They also don't know what they don't know. So as a digital assistant, how do we make, take advantage of what's happening out there and solve these problems? So what we've built is an AI-first, mobile-first digital assistant in your pocket. You ask Ada questions, and you get answers. And if you like the answer you get, you say, thanks, Ada, tell me that every morning, or tell me that at lunchtime, or tell me that in the evening. It's extremely conversational. It's a familiar user interface that we're used to. It's like messaging a digital assistant. It becomes proactive. It learns about you. The more you use it, the more it learns about your business. Um, and you can share that information with your accountant. You can share their information with your business partner. So um, you can also learn more information about how your business is performing. Ada will start to look at your data and tell you things you might not have thought to ask. You can see at the bottom there are a bunch of apps. We have conversation starters. If you connect those apps and you tap on them, these are the kinds of questions you should be asking. So we help educate these small businesses on what they should be asking to make better business decisions and how to take actions. It's about financial information, but as you can see, they're also social media or, or accounting inf or non-financial information. But let's go for a live demo with Alexa. It could also be a little bit about voice. Alexa, open Ada. Welcome to Ada, the digital assistant for your small business. Ask me about your financial, marketing, operational, or people data, or even external data that may help you. What is my cash position? Would you like this for the next seven days or next month? Next seven days. Yes, please. You have two payments due this week. Three thousand five hundred dollars to Dexia and five thousand two hundred fifty dollars to Paymark. Would you like to defer one more payment to short term overdraft? Defer the payment to Paymark. Yes, please. So you can imagine doing that while you're driving in your car, or if you've got Alexa in your home, or Google Assistant in your home. Um, Ada will be wherever you are using voice. 
So how it works, just quickly on the left-hand side, if you're a retailer, those are the different apps you might use, the, big, the data from the big white world, your social, your point of sale, Paymark, Shopify, your accounting app. Our job is to make sense of that data and be that digital assistant to help small businesses understand exactly what's going on from all their, all their different data sources and to take the right actions to help them become more successful. We are a partnering business. We're going to partner with telcos and banks and accounting and advisory firms, but also partnering with a lot of those tech companies out there and trying to work with them to really add value to their small business customers. And yes, we're launching in New Zealand, um, but our, we've got a global view from day one. We want to get out into the UK and to Europe. We want to get out into Australia, but mainly also into the US where there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and so although we're, we're small and we're New Zealand born, um, we're looking at the globe. So that's Ada in a nutshell, talking fast. Um, Peter and I are around, so come and say hi afterwards. We're looking to advantage to, uh, we, we want to be the small business um, digital assistant. So thank you very much. Well done, Brendan. Four minutes on the clock, please. And over to you, judges. Very good, very good, Brendan. Excellent. Oh. Like the demo. Thank um, you. Obviously, a uh, pretty high-tech back end. Yep. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested to know um, what do you think your competitive edge is, and uh, have you got any plans or capability in uh, IP protection? Yeah, so um, we have. Uh, in, in the IP protection side of things, we are building out, um, underneath the natural language processing side of things, we're building out a conversation management platform. So that it, uh, helps us understand the language of small business and to rein, retain the context and understand what happens when small businesses are asking certain questions. Um, we also have a lot of our algorithms um, and our data scientists are working on the algorithms to really understand small business data and serve that up. So that's the, the IP side of it. Um, yes, the back end and, and, and the tech is, built, is, is big and what we do is we focus on vertical by vertical. So if you launch it for cafes, there's a sweet spot or, or, or a suite of applications that small businesses in cafes, for example, use. You add one or two onto that and you're into restaurants and you add a couple more onto that and you're into retail. So we can use that to, to, to build that out. Um, so yeah, we've got the IP side of it sorted out, um, but it's also around tech and, and building and just focusing on a specific vertical and growing it on after that. Makes sense? Um. Really enjoyed it, thank you. Um, what's your strategy for f um, growth fueling through, through uh, capital raising, or how do you plan to get a what percentage is organic yep. revenue versus raises? So, so we're at really early stage. We've um, we're just in our alpha stage and testing with customers. Now we've just closed um, our seed round as well. Um, we will be looking to do more capital raising in the not too distant future. And um, the capital is to grow the team and to, to execute to put the to start spending the marketing dollars. Um, but we're very much a partnering business, so we're working closely with a couple of banks already and a couple of the um, advisory firms that have approached us and some of the, the apps. And so every time we, we onboard a new app, what they really like is the, the good two-way integration that we have with the apps. Um, that means that they're taking us to some of their customers as well, and some of them have got a significant number of customers that we can partner with. So very much around a partnering strategy to get to customers. Um, probably a different tag. Just wondering, how does the security work? So, yep. you, someone has your phone and they talk to the app. How do you authenticate? Yep. So security is, is is down to the security of of the device. Um, you can uh, disconnect the services. Um, the way that it, you connect them in the first place is through industry standard OAuth two type technologies. So only the person with the username and the password of the, of the third party application can connect them in the first place. But then they can all be disconnected from either the app end or the phone end really, really easily. Um, but it does come down to security of the phone as well. Uh, I guess one last question. Any thought about going and using an avatar along with the voice, something like Soul Machines? Yeah, we've been talking, we've actually had conversations with Cell Machines and FaceMe. Um, I think that's probably something we're looking at for a later version, probably more on the web than necessarily on the phone. Uh, but it's something we're absolutely open to, to explore. Um, we can see there's definitely some value in that for certain types of people, and especially if small businesses want to assign an avatar to maybe um, Ada where there's a specific uh, maybe financial services and they can assign a, a specific person to look after finance and ask and answer financial questions. And then maybe somebody could look and feel slightly differently to someone who might be able to answer the marketing type questions. So we're exploring that, but that'll come a lot from what do the customers want and feedback that we get directly from the customers. And the beautiful thing about a natural language platform is that we can see exactly what those questions and answers are. They, they do that on our platform. 
Thank you. All right, well done, Brendan. Round of applause, please.